we are coming today to the end of our series on time of your life. And we've gone uh, quite a lot of different places these last few weeks, but today we're going to end up in a, in a place that's sort of one of my favorite places. And I've told you before, but let me just remind you again a little bit about myself. I am by nature a sarcastic, cynical pessimist. And so there's certain, certain parts of the Bible that really speak to me, and there's other parts that really stretch me. And today we're going to look at one of my favorite books in all of the Bible. Because where I come from, where I'm naturally wired, really just kind of fits in. We're going to go over to the book of Ecclesiastes today. A very happy, upbeat book, if you're familiar with it. It's almost one of those books that, um, that I think you have to either have sort of that pessimistic outlook on life, or have gotten a number of years behind your life, maybe in your mid to late 40s or, or beyond, to really appreciate what Solomon talks about here. Uh, Ecclesiastes is a book uh, written by a guy named Solomon. Solomon was King David's son. He's the third king for Israel. Um, and, and he's a great, he, he's perfectly positioned to tell us the things he's going to tell us throughout this book. Uh, because at, not only was he a third king, he was, he was somebody who, who God blessed with a little bit extra wisdom. God kind of said, what do you want, Solomon, as you take this job, you know? And oftentimes people might say power or, or wealth or, you know, military might. He just simply said, I want wisdom, God. And God said, well, since you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you the rest because wisdom is the thing that can really change not only a person's life, but a nation's life. And so Solomon's perfect position. He was, he was a smart man. He was a wealthy man. He was a scientist. He was a, a poet. He was, he was a lover. He was a strategic guy. And he was perfectly, perfectly positioned because when he was on the throne, Israel was not at war. So he had the perfect opportunity to sort of sit back and to ponder things of life. I mean, when you're wealthy and in a charge and things are going smooth, you can sit back and consider things. And, and he will tell us in the book, I've tried everything. I tried what it was like to be married. Thankfully, Chris, you only have one wife. Solomon had like 300 wives. So, uh, but he was trying it out to see how that kind of worked. He did, he did pleasure. He did, you know, riches. He was a builder. He, he was a planner. He did all this kind of stuff. And, and, and in Solomon, Ecclesiastic, he's going to answer this one question for us. And the question he answers is this, what is the time of our life all about? What's the purpose of our life? And before we get in there, uh, I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads one more time and ask for God's presence to be here, all right? Lord, we pause again, not really to ask for your presence, but to recognize your presence. And to thank you again for some words of wisdom that we really need at this time of life. For some of us, things like things have been successful and things have gone well, but we still sort of have this sense of, of emptiness in our lives. For some of us, it seems like everything we've started maybe starts good, but has really ended in ruins. And maybe we need some perspective on that today. And so whether we're kind of unclear today or, or, or struggling today or feeling empty, or maybe we're on top of the world today. Things have gone right for us. But we know that that's not always going to be the story of life. As much as we'd like to believe it, we know at times that things won't go perfectly for us. And I would just ask you, Father, today, that you would speak into our lives hope, speak into our lives understanding, speak into our lives acceptance of what you have been doing, what you are doing, and what you will do in our lives. And so now we just give you this time to be with us. And we thank you in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Solomon is going to start off with a thesis. You remember back in, in school, you know, you're writing those papers and you had to start off with a thesis. It basically said, here's what I'm going to write about. Here's, you know, here's my bottom line before I give you this, the, uh, uh, all the information about it. So here's Solomon's thesis. Ecclesiastes begins this way. These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. You ready for his thesis statement? Here it is. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now let me give you a little hint about Ecclesiastes. I'm going I'm to teach you through the whole book today. I'm not going to read the whole book, but I'm going to teach you through the whole book. But I believe Ecclesiastes is one of those books that not, is not meant to read, you know, a little bit tonight, a little bit tomorrow, maybe a little bit next week. It's, it's meant to re be read in one setting. Because if you take a little bit doses of it, you will literally want to go out and kill yourself. 
But if you take it all together, you begin to, to understand kind of where he's coming from. Again, a great perspective he has on the idea that he's tried everything. He had the ability to try everything. And his conclusion, he says, is meaningless. That's his thesis. This thing we call life and the hope, meaningless. Now, if you're young, sitting here today, or maybe this is your first time at church in a while, you're thinking, this is not going to go well, is it? I mean, this is a really upbeat, uh, upbeat message, it sounds like it's going to come today, right? But I think sometimes we misplace what we think about upbeat. Because I believe upbeat is when we can understand life, get a better grasp of life, and come up better equipped to deal with life. That's an upbeat message versus just a rah-rah, everything's going to be great, just love Jesus, and everything's going to be fantastic. Because we know we teach our kids that, our Sabbath school classes, all the stuff we know. Just pray to Jesus, everything's going to be fine. And there's a part of that that's true, but there's a part of it that it's hard to understand. And when everything doesn't work out right, what do you do? So sometimes the best thing we can do is step back and have an honest view of things. So Solomon says this, meaningless, utterly meaningless. That's what life's about. So then he goes on and says this. What do people get for all their hard work? Think about your life. What do you get for all your hard work? If I was asked that question, maybe somebody raises their hand in the back and says, uh, well, I got a nice car. All right. What are you going to do with that car? Drive it. Then what are you going to do with it? Sell it. And then what? Buy another car. And what are you going to do with it? Drive it. And what are you going to do with that? Sell it. And then what are you, you know, he says, that's my point. Life just kind of goes on. I mean, what are you getting out of all your hard work? When you look at life, you can add up all the stuff. And all of us have some stuff. Some of us have little piles of stuff. Some of us have big piles of stuff. Some of us have so big a piles of stuff that our garages don't store cars any longer, right? Some of us actually go rent space from some total stranger in order to put all of our valuable stuff in, right? And he says, what do we get? What do we get from all of our hard work? And to go on, he makes us even happier. Generations come, and they, and nothing really changes. We, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right? You know, you, you're, you're little, you go off to school, go to high school, maybe finish high school, maybe go off to college, maybe get a job. At some point, maybe get married, maybe have some kids, maybe get married again, maybe again. I mean, everybody has different little stories here. Maybe you stay single, because that's, that's the way you roll, but you go along at some point. Come to retirement, go out and play some golf. At some point you get sick and you die. And you know what happens the day after you die? Sun comes up. Life goes on, right? There are some people that will be very sad when you die. There will be some people that may be so sad that they will have a hard time getting over it. But there are some people that love you and care about you. That life will go on. It's just the way it works. Generations come, generations go, and, and nothing really changes. I mean, it, it is the cycle of life. Maybe you've seen this. You know, you, you, you're thinking there, sitting there, thinking there, yeah, that, that's how, kind of how my life works. You know, I get up on Monday, go drive through the traffic, go to the office, put in my time. I get home, I drive through the traffic, come on home, get home, have a meal, spend some time with the, the, the kids and the family, watch a little TV, then I'm going to sleep, then I get up the next morning, I drive, and I, my cycle just goes around. It's just like my dad. And I look in the mirror, and lo and behold, I see my dad looking back at me. <laughs> and that's what Solomon's saying, you're starting to get it. That life just has this cycle that goes around and around. I mean, history is linear, but, but life also is this sort of around and around that generations come and they go and stuff pretty much continues like it always has. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, no, 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 Stuff, stuff's new in my life. Today we have iPhones and iPads and i other stuff, you know? We didn't have that when I was a kid. My parents especially didn't have that. My grandparents, you know, they didn't even know what a uh, phone was when they started up. You know, I mean, this is, sure, new stuff comes along, but his point is, people have always come up with inventions. How many of you have all seen the pictures of our early ancestors, the cavemen? have the square, you know, the wheels, and somebody knocked off the corners, and now we have a wheel, you know, a tire. I mean, inventions have happened all the time, right? And so his point is not that, oh, you can't be. His simple point is simply this. Don't think you're so special. 
that you're going to come up with something new and creative. Because I'm Solomon. I'm a pretty bright guy. You, you can't outsmart me. You can't outrich me. I mean, he had people coming from all over the known world at that time to sit at his feet and listen and say, Solomon, answer. Give us the answer to life. Give us the answer how to, how to build this stuff, how to, how to fix this stuff. And he says, even me, with all the stuff, the new stuff I thought was so great, in reality, stuff's been done before. And nothing was really new, truly new under the sun. Now, you may look at this and say, why in the world is this in the Bible? Everybody say that. Why? That's a very good question. And if you're young, you're sitting there thinking, this is depressing. I mean, is this what I have to look forward to? You know, year after year of work and nothing, and I get stuff, but it really doesn't matter because when I get done with my stuff, somebody's going to get it. You know, my kids might get it. They don't know how to handle stuff. They're not going to take as good a care of my stuff as I did. You know, my, my, my husband doesn't, doesn't appreciate all the stuff I do. My boss especially doesn't appreciate all the stuff I do. But here's the thing. Young, you may have that attitude. When you're a little bit older, get a little more miles underneath you, your life, some of you are sitting here today thinking, he's exactly right. I get that. I understand what life, I understand this sort of cycle of life. I understand this sort of ups and downs. I understand this idea of working hard. And really, when it's done to the day, is all this stuff that important? Is it all that valuable? Is, is it really that important? But here's the thing. Woven into this book, Ecclesiastes, is the secret key to understanding life. A secret thing that, that Solomon mentions 29 times in the 12 chapters of this book. You know what it is? Simply this little phrase here, under the sun. Under the sun. 29 times he'll talk about life under the sun. Life as we see it here on this planet. Life as it just kind of happens. This is my observation. This is, I've done my research. I've had my, my, uh, my test groups. You know, I've done all this kind of stuff. This is what life's like. Meaningless. And here under the sun, that's what you're going to have. Now, he's not going to argue that you're never going to have some happy moments. That there's not going to be any great stuff. But his point is, when you put it all together, when life kind of is added up over through all the stuff, you come to the point that, really, has it all been worth it? Would I go back and do it differently if I had the chance? See, Colum Solomon's key to understand our life, you may want to write that down, is simply under the sun. And it's really Solomon's subtle way of saying to us, if all there is to life is what we see, hear, feel under the sun, then there is no meaning. But Solomon is subtle. I mean, small, Solomon's a wise guy. He, he's gotten us to this place where we get the agreement that, you know, really, when you get down to it, life is sort of just has its high points, its low points, but really meaningless when you get done with it. And he wants us to get to that place to understand that under the sun, that's the way it is. But he wants us to look above the sun beyond the sun, beyond life as we see it here today. Here, here's he goes on. He, he get a little happier here. I have verb something else under the sun. He makes kind of a big turn here in his, his writing. The fastest runner doesn't always win. And the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. The wise, they sometimes go hungry. And the skillful, they're not necessarily wealthy. And we all know people like that, right? You probably know somebody who's... who's who is this very skilled craftsman. But you know what? They are eking out a living. And it's not based on their fact that they're not good at what they do. You all know people that, that, are, that are pretty smart that are starving. I knew a guy years ago. Brilliant guy. One of those guys who walks in the room and he's know he's smart. Probably too smart. Because he couldn't hold a job. He just, you know, his mind goes in too many different directions. And he was always hungry, always starving. We know that the fastest doesn't always win. We learned that in, in, in little kids, right? The turtle and the... Doesn't always happen. And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. Sorry, those of you that are still in school, right? <clears throat> or those of you who are teachers. This may not be that kind of line you want to put up in your classroom, but, <clears throat> but it is Solomon's recognition that just because you're educated doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to have a successful life. Now, we may argue the odds... That'll surely help, but, but his point is, you know, this is reality of life. It is all, and I'm I just amazed at this. He says, listen, it is all decided by chance, 
by being at the right place at the right time. And doesn't that just stink? Don't you hate it that you know, it seems like you're, you weren't at the right place at the right time, that somebody else happened to be there? You know, you're checking out at the grocery store. I saw, Lauren and I saw a commercial someplace the other night. You know, they had set this guy up as one of those joke, uh, it was a, tra- a trailer for the joke, but they, uh, one of those joke shows, but the prank shows. And uh, they had this guy standing in line, and this guy's got, you know, a basket of stuff, and he's going to be like the millionth customer, they're going to throw this big thing. So this guy behind me has this bag of chips, and they're in line, and he says, hey, can I, can I just pay for this? Oh, sure, you know. So let's go. as soon as the guy pays for the bag of chips, you know what happens? Stuff drops out of the ceiling, you know, there's music, hey, this is our millionth customer, you know. Here's a check for $100,000, and the guy's face is priceless. all decided by chance. This is why I want you to write this down. There is a randomness under the sun that doesn't make any sense. And you know this is true. You know this is true. And it's what frustrates us. It frustrates us as pastor types because we want to get it all lined up. But if you do X, Y, and Z, this is the payoff. It frustrates you as, as a teacher, as a mechanic, as a cop, Chris. You know, if things, everybody just followed plans, everything would be smooth and great, right? But no, Chris stops you and you go, man, what's this idiot doing to me, right? Or he's slowing me down, right? And they always ask that question, right? That question. <laughs> Do you know why I stopped you? <laughs> I'm hoping you do, but I, I never quite say that, Chris. I, I'm always very, my dad was a cop. I respect what you do, you know. All right, <laughs> uh, let's get back to this. I'm sorry about that, Chris. All right. And listen, sometimes the person who does the right loses, and the person who doesn't prospers. You've seen it happen. Somebody who's working hard, putting in the effort, and they're getting it starting to pay off, and then the economy crashes, and you got somebody that's just a lazy bum, who somehow something happens for him, and everything works out. I mean, I've seen people, you know, get into their 40s or 50s, you know, they've raised a family, and, and they've done everything they can to kind of keep this family together, and one of them says, you know, enough, I'm done. I'm gone, and off they go, and I did everything right, and it didn't pay off. See, sometimes this very futility is what causes us to look beyond life under the sun. And we need to appreciate that. You know, we live in a society and a culture that doesn't like pain. And so we've created things to take away pain. Try a little bit of this, drink that, take this pill, you know. We we just want the pain out of our life. Forgetting sometimes that the pain, the futility, the the frustration that sometimes comes from real life can cause us to look beyond life under the sun to something beyond. Sometimes it's this randomness that can cause us to look up and say, there's got to be more than this because this isn't working. Folks, that's a good thing. Because you may be sitting here today and things have been kind of successful in life, but inside you got kind of this emptiness, this kind of ache. Or maybe you, you know, you've been trying to get at things, do it right way, and it just, every time you think you got it all together, it just seems to fall apart, and you got to go back and do it again and do it again and do it again. And maybe the reason, the reason that, that he's hinting at very subtly here, is so we'll look beyond this life. Look beyond the stuff that we can pile up or the accomplishments we can put on the wall or the pictures we can put on Facebook of all the wonderful things that have happened in our life and see that there's something more to this life. Then he makes a very interesting statement over in chapter 3. He says, Yet God has made everything beautiful in its own time. Are you kidding me, Solomon? You're going to tell me how, you know, life just stinks. It's meaningless. That stuff doesn't work out the way it's supposed to. You know, the people that should win the race the fastest don't. You know, the person that puts in the most effort doesn't always pay off. You're going to tell, and then you're going to stop and say, oh, this beautiful little phrase that God makes everything beautiful in its own time. It's one of those things you see on, on, on little cards that have no meaning to the context. And, and I've tried to maybe, this is actually in Hebrew, which is the language it was written in, is a hard translation for the the translators to figure out what it is. But let me take a shot at this. In the midst of the meaninglessness, randomness, things that don't make sense in life, sometimes we stumble across something so beautiful that we go, wow, there must be something more to this life than this life. There are moments in your life 
and in my life that I just kind of some, 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 sometimes step back and go, whoa, oh, that was, that was perfect. That was just, or that just kind of blows my mind how, how beautiful that, that scenery is or how, how great all that just kind of worked out. And, and it's at those moments that we see that God can take these, this life and, and make things beautiful out of it. And he based on this, then he goes on and says this. He, talking about God, has planted eternity in the human heart. God has planted hu- eternity in the human heart. Folks, this is not a theological statement. This is not a biblical statement. This is just a reality. Because you can go to any culture, any site, any religion around the world, any place around the world, and you will see people who, who, who believe with all their heart that there is something more than this life that we live. And I believe it's because God has put this thing in everybody's heart, whether you're religious or not. This desire to say, God, there's got to be something, or whatever you are, there's got to be something more than what I'm experiencing in life. Because what I'm experiencing doesn't seem to fulfill me. But here's the crazy thing. While God has put eternity in our hearts, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. That we can't fathom it. That we can't comprehend it. And there's a reason for that. Remember we've been talking all this time about the idea of time and not about how much time we have, but what you do with your time. And we also talked about how this was all set up because God is greater and bigger and much beyond what we can experience here. And even though God has put this desire for something more in our heart, we can't really comprehend what it means. It's beyond our imagination. And for some of us, that frustrates us to no end. Because we like to figure things out. We like to get it all lined up. We like to have a nice, tight box. And God's like, there ain't no box big enough to hold me. I know it was bad English, and God wouldn't use bad English, but that's my English, all right? And sometimes, it's in the midst of our frustration that all the pieces don't fit, that the, we have the puzzle all together, but one piece is missing we begin to recognize that God is greater and, and bigger and broader because we can't see the beginning and end because God has no beginning or no. I know. And, and I love this. Solomon will say, I know. Now he's already talked about, none of it makes sense. I can't make sense. And now he'll say, I know something. I know that whatever God does is final. I, I know that. And I know nothing can be added to it or, or taken away from it. That God's purpose in this, I want you guys, God's purpose in this is that people should fear him. Modern Christianity Day, we don't like to talk about fearing God. We'll talk about it means reverencing God, having some awe, but the, the fear aspect. We like to play down this idea that God wants us to fear him. And, and I don't think it's a, I'm going to run and hide kind of fear. I think it's a recognition, a reverential awe that says God really is all-knowing. That he really is, has every power. He can do anything he wants. That he's, he's everywhere at the same time. That all those things are true. And it's beyond what I can comprehend. And I need to make sure that I don't kind of treat him as an equal or a little better than equal, but I treat him as God. Because I can't really fathom this whole thing. I can't really grasp this whole thing. So he said to myself, in due season, God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. God will do the right thing at the right time. I think Solomon tells us this. Because in so much of life, we don't see God coming through when we think he should come through. It's part of that randomness, that stuff that frustrates us. How come, God? Why does this bad thing happen? Why does this terrible thing happen? Why do people who, who, who seem to love you and care about you, it doesn't seem to be working for them? Why, 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 why? And, and Solomon will say, I, I'm a, I trust God in this. I, I know in due season, which means in the season now, Different season. Might be a different season later. Not for you, Chris. That's in one season. <laughs> but in due season, at some time, God will fix it all. And I have to believe Solomon recognizes that that's not going to happen during his lifetime. It isn't going to happen during our lifetime. But will happen after, after you know, sort of the end of our lifetimes. Because then God can make everything right and perfect. Because now if he did we'd have a hard time being around. I told you this before. You know, we want to get rid of evil in the world. The problem with getting rid of all evil in the world, 
hardly wouldn't be anybody here today. Maybe just me. <laughs> True? Because all of us, if we're honest and open and admit for it, there is some evil occasionally that pops out of us. We might try to push it down, but there's a little bit. And it comes in very way. It doesn't mean we're out and out evil, but it could be just, you know, a little snide comment, either that's spoken or just kind of goes around in our mind, right? We think, mm, Sandy, mm, oh, we, you know, shut it down, right? And if God, if we want God to be fair and do we have all evil, then we have to ask him to do away with us. And I don't know about you, I'm not quite ready for that part. But I, but I along with Solomon, believe that there is a time coming when God will fix all this and do the right thing. Here's the big conclusion. Here's Solomon. This is the last verse of Ecclesiastes. This is his final conclusion. He says, after hearing, having heard all this, heard all of this stuff, and talked about all this stuff, this is the conclusion. You know what the conclusion is? Fear God and keep his commands. Fear God and keep his commands. Fear God and keep his commands. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, Mike, I've tried. I mean, I've done that, and stuff still doesn't work out. Fear God and keep his commands. You may be thinking, you know, I've done it all this time, but, but my husband didn't, and he's run off and done something else, and fear God and keep his commands. You know, my boss is a jerk. He's cheating the government. He's cheating his employees. He's not fair to anybody. I, I, we need to do something. Fear God and keep his commands. Because it is not about life being perfect. It's not a lot about life really even making sense. It is about recognizing the giver of life and who will finally decide how short or how long that life will be. So let me just close by talking to four groups this morning. If you're a student here today, high school, college kind of thing, let me just say a couple of words uh, towards you. Um, first is that you are in a great position at this stage of life. Because here's the reality. You get to get it right the first time. So you get to understand that life has this sort of randomness to it. That things don't will always make sense. That just because you have Jesus as your Savior, just because you pray to him, doesn't mean every time your prayer is going to get answered the way you want it to get answered. And that's important to know. And to be able to recognize that, that sometimes things will work out in life and you ought to praise God when it does and sometimes things won't work out in life and you ought to praise God when it does because it's not about how things work or don't work. It's about are you living under the sun or seeing beyond the sun? And you have the opportunity to get it right the first time. To every morning wake up and say, God, I know life may not make sense today, but just be with me and help me to, to, to fear you, to, to give you the right place in my life. And let me just do your will today. Because I can tell you, there are people sitting in this room, there are people watching us online that would love to trade places with you, who would love to go back and do things differently in their life if they could. Because they know when Solomon says this stuff, it makes a lot of sense. Those of you who are single, I don't want you to embrace the myth that if you can just find the right person or the right thing, everything will be right in your world. You know, if you're just searching for all those rights, 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 it ain't going to happen. Because sometimes the one you think is right isn't right. And sometimes the one you think is right is right. But that isn't going to be the solving thing of your life. What you need to do is take this huge, op this huge blessing in your life to take your life and your time and invest in something that will have purpose to it. Purpose that's beyond your life. To take the time you have and, and to pour your life into those things. And you may be sitting here today thinking, oh my God, I don't have a lot of free time. If you believe that, you ought to talk to somebody who's married with kids. Because we laugh at you. And not that we don't love you and don't think you're, you're great and wonderful, but, but we look at our life sometimes and we think, how did I ever have time for all this? I mean, what did I do when I didn't have to get the kids up in the morning and get them off to school and get the breakfast made and, and pick them up after school and bring them home and take them to this practice and that practice and this game and that game and do all this kind of stuff and then make sure I have time for my spouse and do all the kind of stuff there and do this and that. You think, did I just sleep my whole life outside of this? <laughs> you have a unique opp opportunity to make some huge impacts. 
Those of you married, let me just say this to you. Don't trade the integrity of your relationship with your kids or your spouse for a job. For a job someone else is going to have, a car someone else is going to drive, a condo at the beach someone else will live in someday. Because all the stuff you have is going to be somebody else's at some point. And I can tell you again, there are people in this room who would love to go back and have another shot at this whole parenting thing. If you're a first child and you're in here today and you're kind of, you know, elementary school age, I just want to officially apologize to you on behalf of all parents, all right? Because if you're the first child, you are the practice child, right? I was the second child. It was much better for me than my brother. And I, if you get multiple kids, you know, maybe it gets better as you go along. It becomes easier. I, I don't know about that part. But, but the reality is there are people that, that know they messed up back then, that they didn't put in enough time, that they, they sold the integrity of their relationship with their family because their job was important. And their family, they would say, was important. But their job, I've got to provide for my family. I've got to do all that kind of that. We talk ourselves into it. In the midst of making it important, or these things important, we would trade everything in this moment to go back and try to repair that relationship. So take the time now so that later you don't regret and you can't go back and fix it. For the last group is the empty nesters or those that have been by yourself your whole life or you're, you know, you've kind of got enough years underneath this whole thing. I want you to know that you are the punctuation to Solomon's story. You are the living example of how quickly life goes, how valuable relationships are, and you, you offer perspective. And you have a great opportunity to be a blessing at this church. Pastor Ann talked about this marriage uh, series we got coming up, and we're going to start some small groups, going to do some stuff. If you have gone through life and, and, and have some great stories, we'd love to have those stories about how it's kind of worked, because... It's a great time to use what you've experienced in life. Use what Solomon's talked about. You've gone through life to share with others. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, Mike, you know, nobody's going to listen. My kids don't listen to me. That's okay. Some other kids will probably listen to you. You know, sometimes the greatest, we don't always listen to our parents, but we'll listen to somebody else sometimes. Or you may be thinking, well, Mike, you don't know I have messed up in life so bad. What do I have to share with somebody? I'll tell you. You can share your bad example. See, everybody has a purpose in life. Maybe your example is to be the thing of the things that you're not supposed to do, okay? But don't waste. Don't waste the hurts and the pains and the lessons that you've learned through life, through this randomness of life, through this things that haven't always worked out in life. Don't waste it. Try to pass it on so that it literally can go beyond you. Psalm 90, verse 12, is the passage we started with. And it's that prayer of Moses where he simply says, God, teach us. Teach us to number our days. Because we know our days are numbered. Teach us to number our days that we can gain a heart, a heart of wisdom. To see each day as valuable and important. Not as something that's, that's the weight to carry on us that I've blown this day because I haven't spent the right way, but simply to value what comes along each day. To live in the moment, to, to enjoy what's happening. And to celebrate what comes along. Because your days are numbered by a God who has given you purpose beyond what you see and experience under the sun. And more than that, I'd encourage you to leverage that wisdom for a purpose beyond you and for God. So if you'd like to do that, you'd like to help us out with something like that, uh, I'm going to give you an email or address. Get everybody get it ready to write this down. It's my story at lookingforachurch.org. My story at Send something in, and we'll be glad to share your story. Good stories or even bad stories, everybody has a purpose, all right?